Good evening. Welcome to Orthodox Christian Theology. This is Craig Truly. With me today is Deacon Enoch. Unless I'm pronouncing Enoch wrong. How are we doing, Deacon? No, that's good. Enoch is the anglicized version, and it puts me with such great institutions as uh, the Boardwalk Empire Show, main character Enoch. There's a uh, Enoch Highway in Turlock, California. There's also the Enoch Pratt Library in Baltimore, Maryland. You got uh, Enoch Powell over there, politician from uh, London of the 20th century. So I like that. So is it a silent H or is it a really different way to say it? So uh, I've been learning Hebrew during the pandemic. So in Hebrew, it's Hanuk. And uh, oh. if anyone who knows about Hebrew, the only controversy is, is it Hanuk or Henuk? Because the original biblical Hebrew is consonantal and the vowels are added later which is why sometimes it's nice to flip through uh, the Masoretic Hebrew text and the Septuagint one and, and compare and, and see, you know, what's, what's going on. And, and scholars will uh, whip that out alongside the, the Latin and the Ugarit for those who, who know that stuff too. The Ethiopian pronunciation is Henok, which is like, hey, how are you doing? And then Nok rhymes with like yoke. But then, of course, the anglicized is, is uh, Enoch. Some people read it as Enoch because it's often with the C-H. Um, I think older pronunciations would even say Enoch, kind of like epic. Oh, okay. It's, well, it's a point of connection. My wife's name is Nock. No wow. E on the front. Uh, it's a little more complicated than that. The cha is, I call her Nock, but the cha is silent. It's, it's, it's interesting. So anyway, um, Dick Enoch's here today. Because he is presenting an extremely important topic, which isn't covered enough, and we only, I'm sure, scrape the surface, which would be Ethiopian Orthodox Mariology. And I find the topic of Mariology extremely interesting, um, particularly what I find interesting about Ethiopian Orthodox Mariology is the fact that they appear to have a doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. And we will hopefully be able to flesh out precisely what that is to the Ethiopian Orthodox. And, uh, but before we get into that, it's, I have to apologize to the audience like I did to you before the show. I'm not an expert in Ethiopian Orthodoxy. So that means I may not ask the right questions. So be gracious and maybe say, well, a better way to ask this would be, we could definitely do that. But at least it will help expose a lot of Eastern Orthodox Roman Catholics in this audience to the teaching of your church. And on that note, because a lot of people might not know about you, how about you tell us a little about yourself, how you became a deacon, so people kind of situate, you know, how where you are exactly in Ethiopian Orthodoxy. Yeah, so thank you for that. I was, uh, and by the way, Mariology, I'll get into just super briefly before I get into my own personal bio. As with many topics, there are there's actually research on this in the field of cross-cultural studies. And you see this often in Semitic cultures, which Ethiopian culture is one of, in addition to a lot of the things of the Eastern Mediterranean and the Middle East. And that is Mariology is a, is a touchy subject. Um, I don't know how the idiom goes, but messing with a hornet's nest, something or another. Well, this is an African killer bee's nest. And Mariology is a very touchy subject because it, it enters into a measuring contest where everyone wants to show that they are praising the Virgin the most from perhaps you could say um, the least in the Protestant circles and the most in the Roman Catholic circles with a, a more in-between found in, in the Greek communion or in the Afro-Asiatic communion. And I, and I usually don't say Eastern and Oriental only because they both mean East. And it's a question of- You don't of like redundancies? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, um, I, I try to avoid them, although it, it is a Semitic thing to, to use redundancies as, as, as well in terms of, um, Synonym. So only when we get to the subject, I want people to keep in mind that some of the thing that obfuscates this subject is that in the West, we have a different relationship with truth and facts than in the East. And sometimes for the sake of maintaining relationships, people will either bend the truth or uh, present the facts edited in a certain way. 
as to obfuscate it intentionally. And I'll say Mariology has a little bit of that. So my background is I was born and raised in the West in, in Los Angeles, California, where I still am, although I've, I've traveled I'm a little bit. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> no problem, no problem. It's, uh, it's great, it's, it's like Ezekiel and Babylon. Is it true that on the 405, you could go 405 miles per hour? <laughs> Yeah, something approaching that, sometimes three <laughs> to five. A good thing is if you have there a Prius, uh, that's when the automatic electric kicks in. <laughs> All right, continue. <laughs> uh, so I was born and raised in L.A. And uh, to not so outwardly pious parents, but I would say inwardly pious parents, who sent me to a couple of Christian schools and a couple of nondescript ones of various types. I got the New England favor kind of uh, flavor of universalism. I also got Lutheranism at a very young age, uh, but they also baptized me or had me baptized uh, to be more proper in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church from a young age. I had the chance at various moments to, you know, check out various Protestant denominations with various Ethiopian and American friends inviting me, even Catholic parishes. None of it really interested me. And um, ultimately, I went to Pepperdine University, which was in the Church of Christ, which is one of the American kind of congregationalist and revivalists in the, um, I think, Alexander Campbell tradition of the 1800s. Uh, you know, they try to claim that their church started in 40 AD, and we know that's not the case. And so anyway, they made me really confront the idea of church, and I was going to no longer be lukewarm about it, but I was going to, you know, be all in or all out. And after doing my studies of the church, I thought that what communion of the main communions you are in may be less relevant, but it's good to be somewhere attached to one of these historic communions. And I happened to have been baptized in this one. And I personally read the Christologies of the Greek church and the Afroasiatic church, and I could see no difference functionally, but I liked the phrasing of the church where I was in. And you could call me biased and that's a fair assessment. And so I said, <laughs> at least there's no reason to convert anywhere. So I went back to the community in which I was baptized in and slowly went through the ranks of like holy water pourer to uh, starting to pre uh, sing in the choir. Uh, I don't have a great voice, but they said, hey, this guy knows how to read Amharic, so we'll put him there. And then they started uh, asking me to teach in English. And then when the priests were gone, they started asking me to teach in Amharic on off days, not on liturgical days, now on like you, Tuesday. Yeah, Amharic is a common language, I'm guessing, that Amharic like is a dead official. language you had to learn? No, no. Amharic is my first language. Actually, in my household, I spoke Amharic first because of my parents, and it's the official language of Ethiopia. It's called Lisan and Agus, or the, the the tongue of the king. And so it's it's been the official language of Ethiopia since 1270 AD. Uh, so it's got a little bit of history. Before that, it was Ge'ez. So you're and, practically royalty. <laughs> uh that that's a story for another day, but uh <laughs> okay. in, in a sense, yes. But under but right now. Uh, I might be a lesser baron or earl or duke, but uh, as of right now, we're in a federal democracy based off uh, pseudo ethnolinguistics in Ethiopian politics of today. But that seems to be changing. The situations. I, I listened to your show with Zebi. Oh, okay. Nice. Nice. <laughs> Some of the problems that causes. So you rose up through the ranks. Do you need any seminary training to become a deacon? Um, are you this close to becoming a priest? How's all that work? Uh, on a technical and logical uh, level, I could become a priest tomorrow because I'm a deacon and I'm married. And those are pretty much some of the qualifications. You either become married or you choose chastity. And uh, I chose marriage over chastity, uh, well, which is its own form of chastity but or virginity. And um, oh, it has its own difficulties, all right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. The lesser path, according to Paul and John Chrysostom, uh, and Father Josiah Trenum, whom I read Chrysostom through. Um, but, you know, it, it's not something that's on my plate right now, and I won't even consider it for another 10 years. I'm 30 right now, and I wouldn't even want to be one unless I was 40, because it is a lifelong decision, and it's a heavy one. But uh, my local bishop and, and other priests have definitely started uh, casually using terms like archdeacon with, in an unofficial capacity, which is one of those things that, you know, 
kind of leads as a stepping stone. I think in your traditions and in others, there's a more elaborate diaconate and people are comfortable with like 50 and 60 year old deacons. But in our tradition, they kind of just push you out or ask you to be a priest. And yeah, and, they, and I'm sure they need priests because we all do. So they'll, they'll, they'll encourage you nonetheless. So, all <laughs> right. So it's, and I presume it's a little more informal. It's, less professional, right? You don't have to yes. walk away to some monastery for three years before you become a priest. So in Ethiopia, I would say the re the requirements, and I, I put that in scare quotes in case this is uh, an audio only format anywhere. Um, the requirements for even being a deacon are, are different. They're primarily whether you can sing the liturgy in a certain fashion. And uh, under those qualifications in Ethiopia, I would not be a deacon. Uh, to go further than deacon to priesthood, and especially to get hired at one of the churches, there are unofficial requirements of not like Western style seminary, but Ethiopian traditional seminary, which has various schools of, for example, Gz poetry and uh, liturgical and extra liturgical hymnography. And even um, for higher level students, the study of scripture and the patristics and other writings as well. So none of those qualifications really exist in the United States. Uh, and it's really a case-by-case -case basis based off of the, the bishop's directive. There's a lot of economia uh, and decision-making power in the, in the local bishop's hands. Well, it's like the before they had all this fancy stuff, you know, like, all right, he seems good. He doesn't drink too much. He, you know, yeah. make him a priest. I, I mean, if you read First Timothy and stuff, that's pretty much the requirements. But all right, that gives us a, a good kind of background in you and kind of what this is about a little bit for people on the outside. So let me ask this more on the historical end, which is obviously doctrines and teachings that are distinctly Ethiopian come from the Ethiopian people and from their history, their mm -hmm. tradition. And so my question would be then, who preserves Ethiopian history? Because I know the Eastern Orthodox it tends to be, to this day, we have a lot of stuff that hasn't been translated because it's still a manuscript form in monasteries. And so how much of your tradition is still preserved in monasteries? Is it preserved in some other way? Who's preserving your traditions? Yes. So it's preserved in monasteries as well as palaces. So Ethiopia, almost uniquely in Christendom, has its own system of monarchy and its own governance of itself, church and state united from roughly 300 AD till 1974 when the communists crashed that. And because of that lengthy history, you have the monastic culture like you have elsewhere, but you also have something called the Deptera culture. And the Deptera more often than not are people who are deacons, sometimes even priests in their youth, and for whatever reason, sometimes sexual immorality, but sometimes just lack of interest, stop serving in official liturgical capacity and continue serving in the capacity as a scribe and a writer and an author. And they're the ones who write all the chronicles of the kings and of lesser dukes. And um, because we had sultanates underneath the the larger Orthodox Christian monarchy, sometimes a sultan will pay one of these deptera to write for them as well. Uh, so you have the deptera class and you have the monastic class. And, and both of these people are associated with the church because all of education came from the church. And those are the people who would write and preserve the history. And they would write up until the 1800s predominantly in Giz, from the 1800s to the present. Some may still write in Giz, although it's predominantly in Amharic. Now, would it be fair to say due to the climate, um, by historical standards, relatively stable government and, and borders, uh, very defensible because there's highlands and whatnot, is it fair to say that there is a very large degree of manuscripts and paper records that would be atypical for, let's say, other societies have preserved writings? Absolutely. And I would say the majority of them have not been written about in the English language. And so if there are budding scholars out there or people wanting to do this, you know, I have no fear of like some people fear poaching and things like that. I encourage people to do work, but especially if you're an Orthodox Christian and if you don't have any sort of uh, 
you know, knee-jerk reactions against monarchy as a form of governance. Studying the history of manuscripts in Ethiopia is wide open, and I would personally encourage all of you people. My guess is probably around 60 to 70% right now, and I'm trying to improve it so I could do more work. I'm at the point right now where I'm collaborating with other people who have better guess than me, and I could be their frequent collaborators to produce certain manuscript evidence. Right now I'm working on <clears throat> a manuscript that's pretty old on the liturgy of the hours. And I hope in the next year or two to show, for example, one witness to the many witnesses of the liturgy of hours in our tradition. Well, I kind of told you off the air about my pipe dream about uh, <laughs> my son maybe becoming a scholar in that. But yeah, it's it's a field that's wide open. Um, and it's, uh, I don't think it's a totally, it's a Semitic language, correct? So it's not that's like- right. It's not like you're learning something that's not meeting the mold of many other languages, which are still used today. I'll tell you about a friend of mine, <clears throat> Dr. Michael Winger. He's been on my program before and hope to have him on again. He's a Syriac scholar predominantly, and uh, his wife and children are actually native uh, Neo-Aramaic speakers, which is awesome. And from his study of you know Hittite, Ugarit, Hebrew, Arabic, and Syriac, all these things, before he started Giz, he told me when he saw it transliterated into English, meaning not in its own script before he knew the script. Now he knows the script as well. But before his study, he felt like he could understand 50 to 80 percent of it just based off of the the roots, because um, Semitic languages or tongues, as they say, lisan, have these things called bilateral and trilateral roots. So in um, in Greek and Latin and later in German and French and English, you usually begin with some theoretical idea and try to bring it to practice. In Semitic tongues, you begin with some grounded reality like water, for example. And you look at the sky and you'll say like, oh, water above. And so you use these roots of two letters and three letters and you start building verbs and nouns. For example, famously in Genesis, you'll see this in different translations of the English, you'll see it says, you will die death. That sounds redundant to an American ear, but in the Hebrew, as it would be in Ge'ez and in Amharic, you use the same noun and verb for the sake of emphasis. So you really want to emphasize the point of death. So you don't just say you will die, but you will die death. And you see that frequently. And I, I think that makes it easy to learn, especially if you already know one or two other of the Semitic languages. Now, on that note, we have all these manuscripts. We got one uh, one comment here, it's uh, 20,000 books in Ethiopia, um, which is extremely interesting. But the question is, who interprets this history? Who interprets it, I'd like to ask, religiously, right, within the church? But who also interprets it in a broader context? And particularly, because I we're speaking in English, to the West. So in the West, it's predominantly at the university level. Some of the big universities in the West are in Hamburg, Germany, and for example, uh, Hamburg University in Germany and Princeton University in the United States. You'll also see UCLA here in Los Angeles. One of our local priests has worked with the manuscripts there before. The University of Toronto, the University of Washington, all these places have GUS programs and they're working on GUS. In Ethiopia, you have the traditional what I would call the Aksumite school of interpretation. It's called Tereguame. If there are any Aramaic or Syriac speakers out there, it's related to Targum in the Jewish tradition, which is Hebrew Aramaic. Ours is Ge'ez Amharic, sometimes just Ge'ez and Ge'ez. And so the school of interpretation is split into different fields. You have Old Testament studies, New Testament studies. You have uh, what are called the Likawant, which are patristics that we call the sages. And then you have what are called Mazafa uh, Manokosat, which is the book of monks. So those are patristic writings by people who are monks. It, it, it's kind of a funny distinction because the Likawant or the sages are also sometimes monastic, like John Chrysostom is included there. Um, but anyway, there's a distinction between different patristics. And uh, so the people who are the various scholars of that, and especially it's very hierarchical, it's kind of similar to if anyone's ever done Japanese martial arts. There's a teacher and they sit in a chair and there's a senior student and they primarily teach about two to three senior students. And then sometimes 
they'll have a gubae or a conference of anywhere from 20 students that are junior students up to 200 or 400. And that's ongoing. And these people primarily work for zero salary. Their students go around the country begging for food and bring the food to those people. And then those people are also often subsistence farmers. And in large part, the Ethiopian church, the grace of God has been preserved through these teachers or professors, senior students and junior students. So that's the kind of more traditional side and the Western side. Okay. And uh, do you see any radical incongruities between the traditional way of, of handling these sources and perhaps the more textually critical approach that you'd get from Western scholarship? Yeah. So especially when someone is um, really far out of their field. So the field at large is called Ethiopian studies. Sometimes it'll be more narrowed to Ethiopic, which is another way that they refer to Gutes. So Ethiopic studies or Gutes studies. Um, I just corrected a scholar recently, uh, Robert Kaplan, and he's more like a scholar of geography and politics, but he was writing about our church. And he said, the Ethiopian Monophysites are basically a mixture of Greek Orthodoxy and local cults. Now, a sentence like that can only it's be crafted. <laughs> yeah, a <laughs> sentence like that can only be crafted by someone, as I said, who doesn't care for our church and doesn't care for our country and has some other agenda. So, so sometimes I think it's subtle where their disgust kind of leaks out. Um, other times I think uh, they're doing it on purpose and it's really hard to tell the difference. So I, I kind of refrain from individual accusations, but I, I keep this kind of framework in my head of skepticism uh, until proven innocent when I read a lot of those works or unless I know in advance that that they're Christians. For example, there's um, Roger Cowley is a famous person of a British background who was, um, he, I think he was a member of the Anglican church. I could be incorrect, but you know, I trust him more than I trust some more secular people in the university uh, in approaching the church because he has a slightly different mission. Although I, I, I'm not necessarily giving him my 100% trust. There was another wonderful woman. I think her name was um, Sister Helen. I might be getting her name incorrect. And she was in Jerusalem. She wrote on the Psalms and the interpretation of the Psalms in our, in our tradition. And um, I think she was either Swedish or Norwegian. And she was, a, a, I think, a Roman Catholic nun or something like that. And so her approach to us, I feel, had less animosity, again, than perhaps somebody who's from a secular environment. Or again, the, the Ethiopian studies is multidisciplinary. So some people are philologists, meaning they study linguistics, language. Some people are historians. Some people are ethnographers. Some people are anthropologists. And there's so many different fields. Some people are biologists. Um, I, I read a, a biology paper from a set of some Italians recently. So there are so many different fields of study and so many backgrounds that people have. So I would just say, you know, take everything with a, a grain of salt. Oh, uh, uh, an archdeacon is in your chat right now, an Ethiopian archdeacon, uh, Rowan Williams, a.k.a. Tasfa Mikael, and he says uh, Roger Kelly was an Anglican priest. There you go. And, uh, yeah, he's commented on our shows before. The... Um, I don't know what to compare this to, but sometimes you just cannot understand something if you haven't grown up with it or you haven't been totally immersed in it. Mm -hmm. And so no matter how hard or sincere, you're implying some people aren't sincere, they're even being intellectually lazy. That aside, let's presume yeah. the best about some other people is that no matter how sincere, unless you really swim in it, you're not going to know what you're looking at. You can't understand it. Right. Like and if you let me pause for a sec without getting into Christology – uh, I didn't say that earlier, but if, for those who don't know, our church identifies as mia, miaphysite. And the Greek Orthodox Church-run Orthodox Wiki even acknowledges that while saying that it is not necessarily the position of any of the churches in the Greek communion. Whereas the scholar I mentioned just labels us, you know, monophysite, which is one of these ancient heresies. Well, and uh, I don't know if you saw that episode of 60 Minutes about the Coptic Orthodox Church, and they just said flippantly, oh, they're Orthodox, just like, you know, Patriarch Bartholomew. I'm like, <laughs> not exactly. I mean, we got the same word and all. Yeah. But it's, yeah, it's one thing I struggle for in this channel 
is to try to get people to understand orthodoxy. When I say that, obviously, it'd be Eastern orthodoxy in that context, but orthodoxy within its own context. Because unless you actually immerse yourself in the context, you, you're not going to get it. And so that's why it's interesting when you talk about the guys that are pretty much living hand to mouth and getting food and stuff and bartering with disciples of sorts. You know, I tell people, you want to understand orthodoxy, start fasting on Wednesdays and Fridays and start doing the orthodox prayers, right? That's people want to read books, but it's like, no, you actually got to start living the lifestyle if you want to understand what the books are talking about. I, I agree. There's many orthodox authors who've talked about the sensuality of orthodoxy, how through the liturgy you get, you know, your sense of sight through the vestments, your ears through the melodies uh, that have been established over the centuries, your sense of taste if you're a communicant, your sense, uh, your tactile sense if you are, uh, we call it masalem or sal saluting, you know, the icons or the other various holy objects that are in the sanctuary or the holy place, and your sense of smell or your olfactory is through the incense, like everything is is getting hit. And I could tell you as someone who, you know, uh, not left the church formally, but basically stopped attending the church for about a decade. Mm -hmm. When I came back to the church, one of the things that immediately just put me in tears was being having my senses assaulted in that fashion and not having that in, in other traditions. No, it's it's true. It's it's a full immersion experience. It's more than just the mind. We're psychosomatic organisms. The um, now I got a question where it's kind of deep in in the weeds, and we're not going to solve this tonight. So we'll try our best. <laughs> which is what is the Ethiopian Orthodox doctrine of original sin? Okay, so when we talk about original sin, and when we bring it to Mariology. Um, I'll say this, and just as a reminder, it's a delicate subject for many. I think focusing on the perps, the person of the fifth patriarch who fell asleep with the Lord in 2012 in the Western calendar uh, is very useful for this. And I learned about this first from my own personal uh, father confessor. So as you mentioned, the importance of living the Orthodox life and um, participating in the sacramental life of the church is important as you study these matters. My own personal father confessor came to my church because his church, his old parish from a different state, was split over this particular issue of original sin and Mariology. And the hand of the fifth patriarch and the various political changes in Ethiopia in transitioning from communism to federal democracy and, and from 1989. Fifth patriarch that, is... Is a Abuna Paulos. His name is Abuna Paulos, and he was at one time president of the World Council of Churches. And right now, we have co-reigning the fourth and the sixth, which are Abuna Mercorios and Abuna Matias, which is, uh, you know, it's an interesting situation in Orthodox history. And, and so for the audience, the Ethiopians didn't have their own patriarch for years because the cops would send a, a metropolitan, I presume, to be their bishop. And so we're counting up since you've had your own patriarch, correct? Yeah, I'm I'm currently going through the history of the patriarchs. So if I get anything wrong, people could correct me because I haven't fully read on anything. But to the best of my knowledge and to the best of knowledge of very knowledgeable people that I have spoken to, the first metropolitan not patriarch slightly less than patriarch uh metropolitan in ethiopian history comes in the early 300s and that's fermentius whom we call abba salama and he is of greco-syrian background in the eastern part of the roman empire and he is elevated to the title of metropolitan or head bishop of Aksum by the famous uh, Athanasius Contramundo or Athanasius the Great, uh, Athanasius of Alexandria, whom had a hand in the, in the final sort of stamping of the New Testament. From him to 1270 is, I think, a hotly debated history of who was exactly the various patriarchs or metropolitans of Ethiopia. Again, from people I've spoken to and my own research, people kind of sometimes paint this obvious picture that it's always Copts, but it's not always the case. From 1270 to the present, I think the history is clear. And from 1270 to the mid-1900s, uh, 
it was the Copts, no question, because uh, there was a strong link with a particular dynasty that was reestablished in 1270 AD in Ethiopia. And so from about the mid 20th century to the present, we've had six patriarchs, the fifth and the sixth having been disputed, one through four having been indisputed. And um, that happened because of the emperor Haile Selassie, who also convened the first council since uh, before Chalcedon in our communion, uh, also in the 20th century, amongst the Syriac Armenians, the Indians, uh, Ethiopians, and Eritrea hadn't established itself yet at that time. Well, that's uh, that's interesting that uh, I had no idea there was a global council during that time. Depending on how you count global, but yeah, within our communion, all of our communion met in Addis Ababa. Okay, that's uh, we should probably do a show on that, but about original sin. <laughs> so original sin, we yes. call it ancestral sin. I don't think we have a different position than the Greek church on this. We refer to it as ancestral sin. And the basic concept is that we have the consequences of Adam and Eve, but we are not guilty thereof. That's the basic teaching as I was taught by my father confessor. And where does death come from? Death is the is the consequence. And so we have the consequences of the sin, but not the guilt of the actual overt act. So that leads to death. How about on the passions? Does it also affect human willing? Uh, can, can you explain that a little further? So in Greek Orthodox or Eastern Orthodox thought, the passions would be in, in real simple terms, like the West would call concupiscence. So it's that proclivity to want to sin, that temptation to sin, but it has some sort of appeal to you. While if you were not, if you didn't have original sin, it would have no appeal to you, some of these things. Right. So that's interesting. I had never heard it associated with, uh, again, as I was taught, ancestral sin. They called it tantabaso in our tradition. And, and part of the issue is people translating that as well. People will just translate it as original sin. Tent means really old. And uh, abaso comes from transgression. So it's like really old transgression. So you can translate that as original sin, or you could translate that as ancestral sin or ancestral transgression. Um, I have never heard it linked in that way. So I'll say, I don't know in regards to the specific link, but I don't think our church would have any issue with the way that you've described the passions. All right. So, and, and let me just push a little bit on that topic. So like in Romans seven, where St. Paul talks about how he's striving against the flesh the Eastern Orthodox would believe that striving with the flesh is not a condition that's natural, that that that's a result of the fall. It's a consequence of that sin. Now, is that something that, that from what you're aware, Ethiopian Orthodox would make that same connection, or is that not as explicit? I I think that we would make that connection. In fact, I, I taught that recently on my Tawahado Bible study, uh, Romans 7, also taught in our local Sunday school. So I teach it that way. Um, going back to the writings of John Chrysostom, who are again, very plethora and one of the fundamental teachings in the Aksumite school of interpretation. Um, John Chrysostom often talks about the kind of Edenic life and the post Edenic life. Father Paul Nadim Tarazi, a great teacher in the Antiochian church, uh, the Greek Antiochian church, and is a personal mentor of mine. He often comments on this too. And you don't see, for example, um, sex between Adam and Eve until after, you know, you don't see a lot of meat eating until after. So there are many ways in which Edenic life is different than post Edenic life. And again, I don't think there are any differences between our communions in this regard. Okay. And so let me ask just more broadly, and, it, and we're almost certainly in agreement. So this might seem like a less interesting question, but it should be asked, which is, do Ethiopian Orthodox affirm that Theotokos was virgin before birth, during birth, and after birth? Yes. Uh, they call it Kermas um, Anis, Gizes Anis, and Dhras Anis, in case anyone wants to know the Gs out there. But it's exactly the order that you just said, before uh, conception, during conception, and after conception. And, I, and I'd just like to point out for anyone in the audience that doesn't know, uh, I know the Protestants have issue with this, but even Ethiopian Muslims, and I would probably say all 
uh, lowercase o orthodox Muslims out there <laughs> affirm the perpetual virginity of, of Mary, which is so, uh, something Sunni to think Islam about. teaches that as far as you're aware. Yes. And that being that being said, then it's what is the significance of that? Like it's not just it's just for fun, right? So what is the significance according to the Ethiopian Orthodox tradition that the Theotokos is ever virgin? I, I think it's this, uh, so it, it, to take it to the interpretation tradition, um, one of the extra books within the books of interpretation is something called Wuddasi Mariam, which is the praise or the veneration of Mary. And you can find some similar texts in the Coptic tradition under a different name. I'm not recalling it right now. And in our tradition, we attribute it to St. Ephraim the Syrian, I think some scholars would quibble about who exactly may have written the text, but we attribute it to that. And I would say at a bare minimum, it's uh, it's in the tradition of Ephraim, if not written by Ephraim. And so in the Wuddasi Mariam, or the praise of Mary, there are a series of illustrations that are used to talk about uh, the incarnation. It's, it's primarily like a set of prayers for each day of the week and each day is praising the incarnation and it'll have a prayer at the end that says pray for us holy woman and one of the many illustrations they bring up is from ezekiel now i don't know what chapter in ezekiel so i'd have to go find it but it talks about the eastern gate in which only god has entered and exited so mm -hmm. uh when they think of negaramariam or mariology the ethiopian exegetes or interpreters would see passages like that in the old testament and interpret that in light of mary and in the incarnation of christ and so they're not even just basing these off post biblical doctrines but they see it within the biblical text itself and um so and obviously eastern orthodox would agree with that we'd probably have the same allegorical view of the scriptures a lot of these things are types uh, concerning her virginity. And so let me ask this as a follow-up question. Theodokia. He says, uh, the, the deacon uh, Rowan says it's the Theodokia in the Coptic tradition. Okay. It's, uh, and what, what is the Theodokia? It's called the, the praise of Mary or the, very, oh, the, the, the veneration of Mary, where, oh, where, you, where you can read. They have English translations of this for free online. So it's one of the the few things that have been translated from good is into English so that and you can see described this after the Syrian. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so let's talk about a little bit then how is the Theotoko sinless according to the Ethiopian Orthodox? So like she never sinned, I'm guessing, right? She never did anything sinful. Yeah. So <laughs> this is, this is the crux of the issue. This is the crux of all the disputes. And I've seen some of the direct and more indirect conversations you and Subdeacon Dan have had, for example, with Professor or Malfono Sebastian Brock. And I would say the Ethiopian position is, is just as much as the Sebastian Brock position, which is the, the Ephraim, the real Ephraim position. And that is, um, if you go to the meta question, the meta question, as you said earlier, when you're talking about preservation is, who decides the teaching of the church? Is it the elites or is it the masses? And then within the elites, you have to ask, is it each current generation of elites and what they're talking about? Or is it a particular generation of elites that wrote things down? And because the history of synods and patriarchs is so obfuscated in Ethiopian history, uh, you kind of have to go to the Ethiopian sages, whereas in a more normal hierarchical tradition, you would say, what are the synodal uh, documents say? And we have very few synodal documents, so we, we don't have a lot of evidence of what it is that they have said. Uh, we have seen defense against Judaizers in our tradition, and we have documents going back to the 1500s of that. But regards Mariology, there are a lot of different beliefs that people will have. So, one question is, did she never sin and that's it? Or did she never sin and she was incapable of sinning? 
if it's the latter, then we're going into immaculate conception territory in, in the Roman teaching. If it's the former, some people will fear that they're not venerating the Virgin Mary enough. And so they may even believe one thing, but tell you another for the sake of uh, maintaining a relationship. In the person of Abuna Paulos, who I mentioned earlier, in writing while he was at Princeton, before he ascended to patriarch, while he was a bishop, he wrote that the Ethiopian church's position is the former. After the communist government fell and the federal democracy was in power, he was put into the position of patriarch. And from his position there, he never wrote against his previous writing, but in many cases that me and people I know could vouch for, in spoken form, he said that the church's position was the latter. So that that is a very tricky situation. Now what do you do? And if you well, go- the, the latter is more obviously true because the former is what was said when he was immersed in a foreign context, return back to the context where the teachings really belong, you revert back to form, I would think. So, but he never wrote it down. This is from spoken conversations. And if you asked uh, various elites, you may get various answers. So, so that's what complicates, I think the, the issue of the Ethiopian church's official position is who determines the official official position and when. What I would like to see, for example, is the, the current two co-reigning patriarchs, because there was a dispute at the time about his patriarchy, but right now there's no dispute. We have two co-reigning patriarchs and they just met together in May of this year, of 2021. So I would like to see them with the synod come out with a statement on this matter. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. And I think the reason that's not going to happen is that they like uh, um, unanimity. They like everyone to be on the same position when they say that. And well, there, I think right there, now that's not there. Is there unanimity? I can't pronounce words. Unanimity in the written tradition, however, though, like your saints, your saints, you have hymns, you have saints going back 2000 years. I think a lot of this is written, particularly in the last thousand years. Is there a consensus among the written testimony of your saints? So, you can find, you won't find unanimity. You will find that the older texts don't mention it at all. And that more recent texts do mention it and they would be more immaculate conception-y, but nothing outright explicitly says it. And so it's left up to the interpreters and then it goes back to almost like the system of federalism in the United States. You know, is it what the Supreme Court says? Is it what uh, one state will say? You know, for example, for those who don't know, uh, to give kind of uh, maybe a more silly example, officially in the United States, for example, uh, cannabis is prohibited. Various states in the United States have overridden that. So if you go to Ethiopia, th there's no such official document that says, for example, the church's position is immaculate conception. You're not going to find anything like that. Like you said, you can find hymnography um, that is used. Some monasteries use some hypno um, hymnography. Other monasteries do not. And so it's, um, like I said, it was a sort of hierarchical free-for-all, for in a sense, where a lot of abbots and a lot of bishops had a lot of power and had a lot of differences. And um, these tensions were alive and well in the church, I would say, at the same time, throughout all of time. The only thing I'll say is that uh, the older you go, you will not find a pro-immaculate conception stuff. All of that stuff would be at best 700 years old. You know, From the Aksumite period, you wouldn't find anything like that. And so... In Eastern Orthodoxy, we actually have the term immaculate conception in one of our hymns. You could render the Greek words a little different, but they could also be legitimately rendered that way. And it's in reference to the dispassionate conception that Theotokos from Saints Joachim and Anna. Without getting too lurid, meaning mm -hmm. their their copulation was not lustful. We say that too. And so if we're going to say was Mary immaculately conceived and mean that by it, it sounds like both we agree. That, so, that's right. It's uh, in good as they say it uh, in the hymnography of the church, it was not by an unlawful marriage. She was born from lawful 
sex, like you said. We, we have that in our tradition as well. And, and, and that's a, a roundabout way of saying that. And so my question would be, how about the Roman Catholic view, which would be that the grace of Christ was applied to her at the moment of her conception to make an exception where she wouldn't be born with original sin, that sort of immaculate conception. Is there any sort of extrapolation that is in the Ethiopian tradition more specifically consistent with that, or is it more really more consistent just with what you just said, this idea of a dispassionate conception? I think it's more consistent with the latter, the dispassionate one. And I would say, again, in agreement with Sebastian Brock's interpretation of Ephraim the Syrian, the emphasis, especially the older you go in our church, the emphasis is on the Annunciation. And this is what I think frustrates both parties. You will not find ancient witnesses that say that she was not immaculately conceived. You also will not find them that say that she was because the the question was not as relevant, but the emphasis will be on the Annunciation by St. Gabriel. All right, it's, you broke up a little bit there, so sorry if I missed a word or two. But no problem, me... just the emphasis in our church is on the Annunciation by St. Gabriel, and it's even one of the minor holidays of the church, close to Christmas. Yes, and in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, it's called the purification, the Theotokos, and that occurred at the Annunciation. And that's something actually St. Ephraim T. speaks about in some detail, and so does Jacob of Sarug, for example. I don't know if he's a saint in your church. Absolutely. We have, me... a lit we have a liturgy named after him. Now, I just read this the other day. Is St. John of Damascus a saint in your church? Uh, I don't think so. The the John besides Chrysostom, who's famous, is John Saba, who we call Aragawi Manfesawi, or the spiritual elder. And he's actually a member of the Church of the East, along with Isaac the Syrian. And both of their texts are within a book called the Book of the Monks, which is in the School of Interpretation. Okay. it's I have this here, and I'll, I'll share it, because it's... I don't know if tabisha-tashbiha.org is a good resource or not, but being that it's, I'll share a screen because it's, we're going to have a little bit of fun with it. Yeah. And it's an article that says Ethiopian church commemorates John of Damascus. John of Damascus officially commemorated by the Ethiopian Orthodox Church on December 17th. Below is an excerpt from the Synaxion of the Ethiopian church. And it has a, uh, St. John Johannes of Damascus defended the Orthodox faith and sacred images. And so That's my question, yeah. so, but is this something where it sounds more official to maybe Eastern Orthodox eyes and Ethiopian eyes that this may be something that depends on the local monastery or local groups of people, whether or not they would recognize this? So every day is attributed to somebody. And, uh, the process of canonization of saints in the church is similarly disorganized. There's no clear process of canonization. Someone basically becomes a local hero and he gets a sort of local canonization and slowly over time, other people either accept or deny it. One of the funniest cases of that is the case of uh, Emperor Zerayakob and the Stephanites. Father Stephan and his followers are uh, he's a monk and he has a monastic order. He's an abbot and him and his orders are, uh, and his order is systematically hunted down by an emperor and all of them are murdered. Uh, over the next few Kings, somehow they, they, they had a few survivors left currently in the church that the site of their monastery is one of the place where the most manuscripts by uh, Geta Chuhaili, one of the most prolific, uh, he just fell asleep with the Lord about a month ago, one of the most prolific, and I'd say probably the top Western scholar who had some traditional training, Gz expert, where the, the most manuscripts were found that I've seen, some of the most, at least I should say, to uh, humble that statement a little bit, were from Gundagunde, which is this monastery that they were at. And to this day, I, I saw like some priests like a year ago uh, before the recent war broke out saying that people need to celebrate this saint more. Now, again, the king who had a kind of defender of the faith position hunted down and murdered all these people. 
and he they had their own conflict people could read about elsewhere. And so you would think that's that semi-official way of saying that this guy shouldn't be canonized. And yet, this guy's on the calendar too. Uh, at the same time, there's an, another book people read often called The Miracles of Mary, and that book will demonize that guy. So both of these texts, which are intention, and these holidays, and these saints, which are intention, are together. I mentioned John the spiritual elder and Isaac the Syrian. Isaac the Syrian is especially egregious. He's in the church of the Syrian church of the East from like the 700s, centuries after Ephesus and Constantinople and Chalcedon. And yet his writings, or at least some of them, are incorporated in, in our church and we, we accept them fully. We, we teach them in, in that way. So there's no easy answer. It's complicated and these contradictions and tensions live side by side. And it's all a matter of where you think the authority rests. Since so, so, we've had six patriarchs, I think it more clearly rests with our current patriarchs and synods. But you can see different people interpret this in different ways. So, and and it, it seems like you know the issue of magisterial authority just hasn't been settled in any definitive way. But it's not as ridiculous as people think. To use a, a silly example... You could have an aunt and uncle that hate each other from since they're kids, but you could love both your aunt and uncle, yes. right? So they didn't get along with each other, but yet you could be devoted to both your aunt and uncle. So the, it's the it's one like that people don't time. understand that I think goes over their heads most of the time. And it's one of the funniest ones that highlights the difference between the Alexandrian school and the Antiochian school, which both our communions have. There's a Greek church of Antioch and of Alexandria. There's a Coptic and a Syriac church of Alexandria and Antioch. And they commune with each other sometimes when the rest of our churches don't. So go to St. Cyril of Alexandria and to John Chrysostom. They're both two fathers who are before this, uh, our major schism at Chalcedon. And so universally recognized across the Greek and Afro-Asiatic traditions. And they didn't like each other. And you can say that's mostly because you used an uncle. It's mostly because of St. Cyril's uncle. But St. Cyril of Alexandria and John Chrysostom did not like each other. The question is, do you acknowledge both of them as fathers of the church? And the answer is resoundingly yes. And the question is, what do you do about that? And I forget St. Cyril's uncle, the top of my head, I think it was, uh, uh, Theophilus. It was either Theophilus or Theodosius. Yeah. No, it's, uh, it's Theophilus. Yeah. Uh, Theodosius is the emperor, but uh, Theophilus is uh, called a saint in the fifth ecumenical council. So it gets like even dicier. A lot of Eastern Orthodox will say, well, he's not a saint. The cops see him as a saint, but technically he's listed as a saint in the fifth ecumenical council. So that's something interesting. And on that note, to make it even murkier waters about St. <laughs> Isaac the Syrian, a lot of people don't know. I have a video on this channel called the the Church Union You Never Heard Of. And believe it or not, in the seventh century, under the Emperor Heraclius, the Byzantine Empire, there was a reunion with both the Nestorian communion, because the Roman Empire actually conquered the Persian Empire right before the rise of the Caliphate, but also what they were called the modern uh, the moderate Theodosians, or rather the moderate uh, Miaphysites in Egypt. And so there was actually union at one point with Nestorians and Miaphysites, and we wouldn't call them properly some Orthodox because this was a monothelite, monoenergist union. But St. Isaac the Syrian was arguably in union with the rest of the global church at that time. Now, apparently, maybe that trickled its way down to Ethiopia. I don't know. I'd be very interested to know what side of the Miaphysite, because generally the early Ethiopian church were talking fifth, uh, particularly sixth, seventh century, I was under the impression that they were Julianists, Julian of Hel Helicanarsis, I have to pronounce it. That's how they've been portrayed, for example, by Dr. W.H.M. Friends in uh, in his research on the uh, Biophysites. But again, that's taking a Western scholar and most of the most of that book isn't about Ethiopia, though it does talk about Upper Egypt and Ethiopia a little bit. And I was under the impression that they were under Julianist sway at that time. But maybe not, or, or however that was, so that Union Isaac stuff made its way to Ethiopia. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, uh, I haven't seen, again, it's a very dark period from about 300 to 1270. Mm -hmm. And so I haven't seen any Ethiopian authors in that time. I'd have to I'd have to go read and, and see that to see what 
research he's pointing to, the main stuff that you see is from the 1200s, 1300s to the current, if you're talking about Ethiopian authors. And then of course, in addition to the Ethiopian authors, we have the patristics from all over the world that we've mentioned. Now, because someone in the audience may be interested, is there stuff perhaps before the 1200s that's out there, but just really hasn't been like, let's say unearthed yet. It's just in some monastery or palace somewhere and really not being read or anything. Yeah. So this is all ongoing. And, um, for example, I will say the liturgy of the hours that I'm working on someone without any sort of real historiography or real dating has labeled it from like the 1400s or 1500s. My friend and I believe it's much older and potentially from that Oxumite period. So there's, <laughs> there are manuscripts out there that have not been worked on. Some of them may have been digitized, but nobody's worked on them. For example, Getacho Haile, one of the major things that he did is he digitized hundreds, if not thousands of these manuscripts, but there's no way he had the time to work on all of them. So even if you just worked on all the manuscripts that he uploaded and, and digitized, and he did a lot of his work um, in Minnesota, as well as Ethiopia and Egypt, uh, and some work at UCLA here in Los Angeles, even if someone were to just go through there, I'm sure you can find gems from the Oxumite period. But to be honest, from the Oxumite period, the things that I've seen is like a Psalter with some extra prayers, uh, the Garima Gospels, which are some of the oldest illuminated Gospels found on, on Earth. You know, They date it between the 400s and the 600s. I think it's closer to the 400s, and that's another Western bias, I think. They don't want to <laughs> have something that old in Ethiopia. Um, you, you see various um, potentially uh, liturgical fragments or extra liturgical fragments, but I have not seen a ton of theology by Ethiopian authors in the 700s. If someone has access to that, please send it my way. Now it's, uh, let me ask, uh, let me ask this question because it might help center where we're the same or different when it comes to the issue of Mariology, which would mm -hmm. be how do, the Ethiopian Orthodox best you understand, understand the fathers that speak of the Theotokos doubting or turning from passions and et cetera. I mean, is that something you ever came across or is that never spoken about in Ethiopian Orthodoxy? Yeah, it's, um, it's very interesting. And again, this is, um, this is no longer in the realm of dogma. And now it's more in, in the schools of interpretation. And interestingly enough, even within Ethiopia, there is something called Laibet and Tachbet, which is the upper house and the lower house. And so both of the people uh, or the schools or the houses as they're called in Giz of interpretation in Ethiopia are responsible for memorizing the patristic te texts if they're studying the patristics and uh, as they're handed down to them in translation and memorizing the scriptures. And they are also tasked with comparing the various manuscripts they have and fixing them and editing them if they find errors. That's the number one task. The next task is to interpret them. But again, the interpretation is not dogmatic and it can't be. And it's most obvious because there are these two different schools. And I may uh, confuse them upper and lower house, but one of them has fewer words in their interpretation and the other one has more words. And that's how they're kind of most famous. So the way they approach this issue would be slightly different, but again, in brief, some of them would reflect on that and either explain it away or, or bolster it. For example, I think one of the most famous ones regarding what you're saying is this thing that Protestants like to point to where they say, where Jesus says woman, and he, you know, does what she says right after that in terms of fulfilling her earthly intercession and turning the water into wine at Galilee, uh, of Cana of Galilee. So the fathers uh, would, they're not even thinking of the Protestants, but the Protestants would take that woman and think it's like some sort of pejorative used against the Theotokos. The fathers at various length, with a various length of words would say, oh, she's a woman. That means she's one of the beautiful people made in the image of Eve who came from Adam and God did this and that and a third. And so they would come up with various illustrations and examples. Everything they say is with an illustration. 
and they would use biblical references, but then they would also use local Amharic and phrases and sayings to talk about why that's a good thing. So they would, they wouldn't say like that she doesn't doubt, but they would explain the context of the doubt. And that's why many authors, and I would agree with them, uh, like Cowley, whom I've mentioned earlier, but I, I would agree with this assessment as well, have pointed to, uh, and I will add to this by saying, the hierarchy of the church has this Alexandrian vibe or spirit to it, but the school of interpretation is firmly Antiochian. So this sort of contextual analysis of her doubt, of her being called woman by the Lord, of, of all of these things that could be seen or interpreted otherwise. If anything is not clear in the text, what they do is they preserve the text by repeating it verbatim, and then they give a contextual, biblical, and local cultural illustrations as to why it is the case. Okay, and that's... It's interesting because within the Eastern Orthodox tradition, doubts would be an exhibition of gnomic willing. And I'm pretty sure that's something that doesn't exist in Ethiopian Orthodoxy. It doesn't exist in Roman Catholicism either. But it's a result of the fall. The idea was before the fall, there was no flux in how we would think and eternalize things. We'd be able to reflexively do what's good unless we were deceived. And so the fathers would speak of doubt and they'd speak of the Theotokos has been healed from that doubt. And so like St. Saint, uh, Saint Cyril of Alexandria or St. Maximus in our tradition would speak of the Theotokos being healed from that doubt because it was seen as something deficient. But for example, this, this is why you said, look, people don't want to ever say anything deficient. St. Maximus, to put this into perspective, says she was healed like lightning. So it was like, like that. Right. So like it didn't happen. It was going to happen. And boom, it didn't happen because of the grace of God. And so it kind of preserves this orthodox view of the Theotokos having original sin, but the Theotokos being all holy. So there's a tension, but that's how they attempt to harmonize it. It, it. it appears to me that the Ethiopian Orthodox will say the same things. They'll reiterate this, what the scripture says, or this is what the saints say, but perhaps they're, interpretations are less developed. I'm guessing, like I'm guessing what I just said to you doesn't really, you never heard that within the I've, Ethiopian like, context. For example, uh, was it no noetic that you said it was? I'm sorry? I, I don't know the technical term. Anomic you, will. Anomic will. Anomic. Like, or, and, that, and that also, the best English translation for that would just be like free will. Yeah. Um, I, they would use a term like free will. Um, but... I would say a lot of the technical terms that I think, frankly, caused a lot of schisms, it, it's not there. That's another aspect of the Antiochian school of biblical exegesis, which is also in the Aksumite school. It's, um, it's not overly simplistic, but it's like it's language that would be understood by the vast majority of the people at the time and illustrations that people would use to like uh, – to put it differently, the Ethiopian church, I would argue in its school of interpretation, is less theologian and more homileticist, more food for the soul. Like in, in the telling of the doctrine, it wouldn't be usually just doctrine for the sake of doctrine. There's usually an imperative. There's usually a call to action associated with the doctrine. So you, you begin in the telling of the doctrine, and then they would use that to kind of feed the flock. And it's obviously the Eastern Orthodox have that as well. But it's interesting that even our hymnography will get into some of this high level stuff. But it's a result of theological controversies that didn't yeah. exist in Ethiopia. So those things never just never got clarified for you guys. The um, At least I'm guessing so. But let me let me ask this, and this is a less complicated question, but from what I'm guessing, I've heard Ethiopian Orthodox tell me we believe in the Immaculate Conception. They would even take issue when I'm teaching the Eastern Orthodox doctrine because it sounds blasphemous to them. And so I, I asked the this one, oh, he disappeared. All right, Dickie Enoch's back. I don't know what happened there. But um, I asked this one Ethiopian guy, I said, uh, you know, 
well, the Coptic Orthodox also teach Theotokos had original sin. And he said, well, they are wrong, he said, because they've been corrupted by you guys. <laughs> and this is not like people forget how big the Ethiopian church is. So I, I presume you guys would have a certain view of you, almost your own Catholicity, right? You're, you don't need... Right, you you don't need the Greek Orthodox or the Syriac, or you don't need anyone to feel that you got everything you need, right? You're not dependent upon anyone else. But what is your own personal reaction? It sounds like you gave more of a guarded answer over the Immaculate Conception. Um, have what have you seen with the let's say other Oriental Orthodox, lack of a better term, and them yeah. essentially seem to agree with the Eastern Orthodox? Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I I think that the Ethiopian church's position is not the immaculate conception, but I think that it is such a touchy subject that even the synod as it, as it is now wouldn't want to publicly say that because of the backlash that would happen were they to publicly say it. And I think that you may find, um, you know, even around things like the incarnation and intercession, I can tell you just a few years ago, there was a controversy where two different bishops got up and publicly said two opposite teachings. And how that concluded is that they went to a synodal meeting and at the synodal meeting, they chose one of the bishops teachings over the other. And, uh, you know, they kind of demoted the other guy, but they never publicly told, you know, everyone what exactly happened regarding that kind of doctrine. And it goes to the, the meta level analysis of Semitic culture that I said at the beginning, it's like some truths, be they as they may, are dangerous to people's relationships. And being that I grew up in the West, I can say that in a way that I think others cannot. So, you know, I would hope, and I would say as a deacon, I would submit to whatever decision that my synod made on the subject. And I have confidence that what they said would be in agreement with especially the early Syriac fathers, whom I think affected our school of interpretation the most. Um, but I think that it wouldn't be on this subject different than the teaching of, of the Greek fathers um, at all. I think it, it would be a point of, of agreement. Now, Deacon Enoch, do we have a few more minutes for questions, or you got to get running and we'll bid you? For I a got five minutes. I got five. Right. Minutes. So, then guys, we're not going to. All right, five hours. All right, five minutes. All right. <laughs> it's uh, we we will ask what we could get to, and we will say farewell. We have this question about the Book of Enoch's. If these watchers, fallen angels, did breed with human women, did they produce Nephilim, half human, half demon race of wicked giants? Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I think that's what the, the book says itself. And the controversy amongst biblical scholars who look at the Book of Enoch is what does Nephilim mean? So you wrote it as giants, and I think that's one interpretation. Uh, Father Paul Nadim Tarazi, whom I mentioned earlier, is a mentor and very proficient at Hebrew. He taught at St. Vladimir's Seminary for 40 years in the Old Testament uh, for Hebrew and Old Testament studies. He says that Nephilim means fallen ones, and he goes back to the, the Hebrew roots when he says that. And I trust his interpretation of what that means. And again, I, I view these things kind of differently. Whether you take them as giants or fallen ones, the Book of Enoch describes them as 300 cubits, which is like arm lengths, you know, height. So they are giant, but that doesn't mean that the word Nephilim means giant. So uh, yeah, that is, yeah, that's the premise of the Book of Enoch. Let me ask you this real question. Could you please ask him what his understanding on the pork prohibition is? Is it cultural, theological, any sources? Thank you. Yeah, it's cultural, but it's also very complicated. As I mentioned earlier, we have official writings from the 1500s um, under Emperor Galadios, which is an Ethiopian way of saying Claudius. And so the Ethiopian Emperor Claudius or Galadios gathered the Lycaon or the sages of his time because the Roman Catholic Church, which was coming in a colonial capacity with the Portuguese and with other people later, who was trying to convert Ethiopia to becoming a Catholic country, was trying to sow seeds of division amongst people. And they were saying the Ethiopians are not Christians, they're Jews, because they do circumcision and because they honor the Sabbath and because they don't eat pork. 
I know people even in the United States who, for example, won't wash their laundry on, on Fridays and potentially Saturdays, depending on how they're trying to honor the Sabbath. I know many people who don't eat pork, and I don't know anyone who isn't circumcised, who's Ethiopian Orthodox. In those writings that Emperor Galadios gathered together of the sages of that time who gave response to the Portuguese Catholics, it said plainly that these are all cultural matters and they are not matters of religion. What complicates it is that there's this huge Jewish narrative in Ethiopia. And so some people will say even, well, it's mandatory for us, but any converts don't have to do it. Or they'll try to do different things like that. And it'll go back to what you were saying, the question of magisterium, uh, magisterium of the past, magisterium of the present, and then whoever your local priest is and, and what it is that they would say. Now, I'll, this will be the last question, unless somehow we had a time to ask uh, about the musical composer. Um, we go to clergy first. Rowan asks, what is your analysis of the influence of the Roman Catholic Church regarding the Immaculate Conception in Ethiopia? I would agree. So I go back to what I was saying before. I view it as a phallic measuring contest, excuse the imagery, of who venerates the Virgin Mary the most. And I believe that intentionally. There is very clear evidence of Freemasons and Roman Catholics of various stripes across various ages who wanted to trace the Nile River and ended up in Ethiopia. And they have many different writings. And I think that they were very plain in trying to overthrow Ethiopia in some sense. With the Emperor Susnios, they were temporarily successful. Emperor Susnios was an Ethiopian king who converted to Catholicism in the 1600s. So they were temporarily successful. Immediately, there was a reaction to that from nuns and even from his own son, Fasil, who took over after him. And that was rooted out. But yes, I think the Romans basically came in and said, look how we venerate Mary. And the proud Ethiopian riflemen that they are said, you're not going to venerate the Virgin Mary more than us. And we'll show you. That was, yeah, we'll show you. We'll out venerate <laughs> her. And I think that that's how it began. But I don't think like after a certain generation, this is how these things happen. People forget about how it began and they just tend to have that view without knowing the history behind it. So, yeah, I would agree that that's that's probably the major influence. Um, and that's because Ethiopia was not a hermit kingdom. But yeah, thank you so much for having me, Craig. Yes. Yeah, so, well, any plugs before you go? Yes, uh, Tawahado Bible Study, T-E-W-A-H-I-D-O, Bible Study. You can find that at Spotify. You could find it on Apple, Google, wherever you find podcasts, even YouTube. YouTube, just look for P-O-A-A-S, P-O-A-A-S. That's the philosophy of art and science. Thank you. And your channel is linked to the bottom. I know you got to run. Show, if this show's blessed you, go to Deacon Enoch's channel. You can go donate to Churches of Cambodia. The thing scrolls the bottom here all the time. I won't repeat it again because I'm not going to hold you a moment longer. Let me just thank you again for coming on. You've been awesome. And we got to make a time to talk about that council that happened under Selassie. That'd be really awesome. That would be great. The Council of Addis Ababa. Thank you. God bless you. Amen. Guys, I'll end the show and end all the shows by saying, fight to death for the truth. The Lord God will fight for you as Jesus, Jesus as Sirach says. God bless you all. Have a great day.